So, Father, as we come together around your word, gosh, love your word. Love your word. I'm still continuing along the line of what it is to be a new creation, the reality of living as a new creation. I'm going to be continuing this for a while to actually living it. We're translating. We're doing whatever it is that God wants us to do, but we're actually living in the realm of the spirit instead of visiting it on occasion. We're actually living out of it and, uh, and living as a new creation on earth. And so I'm going to continue that, but I, I was led, I, I believe, by the Holy Spirit. But, you know, every time you say something like that, it kind of shuts down conversation, doesn't it? Oh, I heard from God. Well, that sort of says, well, I can't really argue with what you think God spoke. But um, I, want to, I want to continue the new creation reality of what it actually means, of, of how amazing it is to live as one. And I, I'm going to be doing the book of Ephesians for the next few Sundays. Not next Sunday, obviously, we'll get breakfasting. But um, we're going to be doing the, the book of Ephesians because it is just such a beautiful book. And, and it's, it, you just dive into the grace of it and you get drunk on the wine of the book of Ephesians. So I want to, we're just going to be studying that because if you want to know what new creation is, Ephesians will tell you about your wealth. It will tell you about the walk of a new creation. It will even tell you about the war of a new creation. But uh, in, in the book of Ephesians, you've got different sections. It's just, oh, it's just such a beautiful book. It's just so wonderful. Uh, but it's, so, it's, it's got these um, very real boundaries like chapters one to three are all about the the doctrine chapters four to six is all about how you walk it out the practical application but even in chapter one verse one there is a, and we'll look at all of these things there is a division between saints and the faithful in christ chapter one verse one there are the saints in the church of ephesus and then there are the faithful in christ those who are faithful so it can be you can be a saint but you might not necessarily be faithful yeah, so it's just an interesting concept, but it's just the most beautiful book, and I want us to get past stodginess. I want us to get past what it actually says. You know, let's just go with the flow of the spirit and the life of spirit as we dive into Ephesians. And so today's just a bit of a background. Today's just going to say, let's have a look at it. And starting the fourteenth, the day, the week after our our birthday, uh, we're actually going to be starting in chapter one, verse one, and going through. It won't necessarily be a real in-depth study, but it will be. Oh, my gosh, if you want to know who you are as a new creation in Christ, if you want to know how to live as a supernatural being or a spiritual being, if you want to know what it is to flow with the Holy Ghost, to be inebriated, to be influenced by the Holy Spirit, if you want to know any of these things, it's all in the book of Ephesians. It is absolutely glorious. And so I wasn't going to go here. I was going in another direction. And then I just had no peace. I'm thinking, oh, God, is it? And then I've got Ephesians. I'm saying, oh, God, is it this or is it that? And you know how your mind goes sometimes? It seems to be both. And I think, I can't do both. It's one or the other. Which one is it? So Danny and I prayed, and we, it, was, it was Ephesians. So we're just going to settle on that. But it's not from the point of view. This is not like a Bible study. This is a book of life. Yes. This is a book of um, grace that is so out there that when you drink of the grace that's in the book of Ephesians, you can't stop worshipping God. It is just the most exquisite book, letter, I should say letter rather than a book. So just for the next few weeks, we're going to be looking at the letter of Ephesians, which Paul wrote. And um, I said it's just... Amazing, the foundation of the book of Ephesians is found in the book of Acts. And we'll be looking at that. It's about wealth, walk and war. There's clear de demarcations. But it is actually doctrinal. It is teaching of in instruction in righteousness. It is a doctrinal book. Um, and it's, it's just... And, and three books are grouped together. Like often you read Ephesians, then you, you read Colossians, and you think... Oh, I've seen that in Ephesians. Or you're reading Colossians, or you're reading Ephesians, you think, oh, that's in Colossians. So Ephesians, Philippians, and Colossians go together. Um, and all the, these three letters, Philippians, Ephesians, and Colossians, are all letters about the ecclesia or to the ecclesia. It's about your identity in Christ. It is about um, mystery. You know, Colossians comes out with, you know, Christ in you, the, the mystery of Christ in me, the hope of glory. It is about oneness. It is about the body and the bride. It's about looking to Jesus. It's about the, the, um, the growth in depth in relationship into him. 
because it, everything comes out of our relationship. It's got to be continually growing. You know, like if we're in a marriage, um, not that I have been for a long time, so I can't really say, but you've got to look after the relationship or it gets really stale. Or we take people for granted, even in our own families, we take people for granted. And it's, we're recognising that relationships need to be nurtured. We need to love people. We need to take care of them. I need to hear what my, my family is saying. You know, like, what, what's different? What, what are they saying that I'm not picking up? Everything changes. And um, for Danielle and, and myself and Trey, you know, we live together. We've lived together for years. A long time, Danny, isn't it? <laughs> That's a long time. 24 years out of 26, I think, for Trey. But we've lived together as an extended family and we love each other and we have so much fun together. But again, we have to recognise when changes are happening. I have to recognise that, okay, wait a minute, something's happening here in the family unit. I, I need to be a little bit more sensitive. I need to, what's actually going on? Who, what's, what are you doing in their hearts, God? So every relationship needs to be worked on. You know, sometimes... And I know with some members of my family, they still see me as like about 30 years ago. You know, a single mum trapped in a certain kind of circumstance. They haven't seen that I've grown or changed. They still relate to me back then. My dad never let me got past the age of three. As far as my dad was concerned, I was always going to be three. He was always going to have to tell me what to do. I was never going to be allowed to grow up. And then, when I, I, and then he used to say to me, not realising what it was, but he would say to me, oh, well, you can do that when you're 49. When you're 49, you've got the freedom to do whatever you want. You know, and even it was such a statement in my family that on my 48th birthday, my, my brother sent a letter to Dad saying, how about giving a time off for good, good behaviour? <laughs> <laughs> but it was, it was just these words that kept continuing. And Dad wasn't born again. He had no understanding of what he was doing, but it's kind of like, you know, this cage that goes around us. Well, as we dive into the book of Ephesians, let's get rid of every cage, yeah. right? Let's just really relate to how the Father sees us, to what he wants to do with us. And, yeah, my dad is not a bad man. He's a good man. He loved me with all of his heart. He was just, a, you know, he was a, he was a bushy. His father was a bushy. Um, and it was just a little bit different. But it's, it's recognising that relationships take time and they take nurturing so in Ephesians if you want to turn to Acts chapter 19 we're going to start in Acts 18 19 this is the foundation of Ephesians I mean sometimes we just pick up the letter of Ephesians and read it not really understanding that oh wait a minute um, it was actually birthed in the book of Acts. And a lot of amazing things happened in Acts, in Ephesus. So in Acts chapter 18, verse 19, it says then, um, in verse 18, afterward Paul remained many days longer and then told the brethren farewell and sailed for Syria. And he was accompanied by Priscilla and Aquila. At Sencre, Paul cut his hair for he had made a vow then they arrived in Ephesus, and Paul left the others there, but he himself entered a synagogue. And that goes right through to Acts chapter 20, verse 31. That whole thing from Acts chapter 18, verse 19, to the end of chapter 20, is all about events that happened in Ephesus. And so as we have an understanding of that, we have an understanding of what's going on in the Ephesians church. So Paul's second and third missionary journeys was where he touched down. His second journey uh, is mentioned in Acts chapter 18, verse um, 19, right there. That was his second one. And then he came back, I think it was in Acts 19, 41. No, I can't, yeah. Acts 19 you know, is, is the second missionary journey. Or is, sorry, it's the second and third missionary journeys that he ended up in Ephesus. But the third trip... The last one that he made, he spent three years in Ephesus, longer than he spent anywhere else. And that's where he had the school of Tyrannus, you know, where he preached all day and the guy fell out of the window and died and then they had to raise him from the dead because he just, Paul didn't know when to shut up, probably like me, and he just kept talking and, and the guy was sort of sitting on the windowsill and then all of a sudden it's like, oh, I'm so tired. And out the window he went. But three years he was in Ephesus. And so for, that, for those three years... 
they basically evangelized the whole of known Asia at that time. Like, look at us. We can't even evangelize the Gold Coast, really. But they evangelized the whole of known Asia in, in, in those three years. Basically, it took them two years to do it. It's just an incredible story. So as you look at these chapters in chapter Acts, chapters 18 to the end of verse 20, this is the foundation of the Ephesus church. Paul poured himself out in Ephesus for three years. And then he made a farewell to the elders of the church in Ephesus on the beach and they all prayed and hugged each other and they were reduced to tears because he was moving on. It's just the most amazing book, you know, but we've got to start looking at it as people. Sometimes we read the Bible and it's kind of like, you know, this verse and that verse, but we don't really look at relationships. We don't really look at what was going on. You know, just a little sidetrack. Think about the great grace of God because it's only by grace and faith we're saved, right? Yes. Think about the grace of God. That woman that was caught in the sin of adultery and then she's brought before Jesus, not the man, just the woman, brought before Jesus and accused of adultery and they're waiting to stone her. They're waiting for permission from him to stone her. But he kneels down and he starts writing in the dust. But he kneels and he brings a grace atmosphere into the whole situation, the grace of the Father. And he says to her, go and, you know, when they all could have like slunk away, he said to the woman, go and sin no more, right? Just go. Sins are forgiven. The grace of God, the grace of God. We need to be able to release the grace of God to people. So Jesus, when you think about Jesus, his grace He's the love of the Father in action. You want to know what the Father's like? Look at Jesus. You want to know who Jesus resembles? Check out Father God. Because they were one. Yeah. And just, you know, whatever he did, it was about healing. It was about redemption. It was about restoration. It was about wholeness. And it was about releasing grace. Just grace. God loved us so much. In the depths of our sin, under the power of the prince of the, the spirit of the air, he loved us so much that the heavenly council decided they're going to release the Son of God. He's going to become a human being. He's going to take on the sins of every person in the world. He's going to take our place on that cross. And he did it willingly for the joy that was set before him. So Father planned it, Jesus joyfully carried it out and the Holy Spirit was the power behind it all. But when you think about what God did when he released his son to be tortured by the people he'd made, tortured, whipped, crucified, vilified, and yet he went through it all. And if only one person would have responded, he would have done it anyway. The love of the Father, we have no understanding or revelation of the depth of the Father's love. And, and Jesus went through it so amazingly. Even in the Garden of Gethsemane, when he's sweating drops of blood and he's saying, God, if it's your will, there's another way. But there wasn't. So he went through with it. If you just had a revelation of how much you are loved, just loved by the Father, you don't have to do anything, you don't have to be anything, you're his child, he loves. And so we recognise that these amazing things, because of the grace of God, so everywhere in Ephesians it's all about grace. And Ephesians was, or Ephesus was a chief city. It was in a Roman province. It was nowadays, it's modern Turkey. Uh, and it was the site for the temple of Diana. So we're going to be looking at that. And Diana was actually a many breasted goddess called Artemis. And the only way to worship that goddess was by prostitution. So it was a pretty dark town, pretty evil place. Um, but most of Asia was evangelised through the base in Ephesus. 
Amazing things happen there. So let me just share some of them. If you want to turn to Acts chapter 19. In starting in verse 1, it says, While Apollos was in Corinth, Paul went through the upper inland districts and came down to Ephesus. There he found some disciples, and he asked them, Did you receive the Holy Spirit when you believed on Jesus as the Christ? And they said, No, we've not even heard that there is a Holy Spirit. And he asked them, Into what baptism then were you baptised? And they said, Into John's baptism. And Paul said, John baptised with the baptism of repentance. Um, continually telling the people that they should believe in the one who was to come after him in Jesus. And on hearing this, they were baptized again, but this time in the name of the Lord Jesus. And Paul laid his hands upon them and the Holy Spirit came on them and they spoke in tongues and prophesied. And there were about 12 of them. So in Acts chapter 19, verse 1 to 7, disciples of John the Baptist were baptized in the Holy Ghost, baptized in water, baptized in the name of Jesus. What a, what a great way to start something, that there is a baptism of people who already were committed, but they were missing out on the fullness of God. And so at the very beginning of the F F Ephesus church or Ephesians, whatever you want to say, it starts off with, oh my gosh, you're missing out on something God's got for you. Here it is. So for those of you who feel like you're missing out, that there's more, that God's got much more, but you're not even tasting it, you can't even quite reach it. I'm telling you right now that Jesus and the Holy Spirit are here and they want to make sure that you have the fullness of everything the Father's got for you because that's what he's saying there. Like we read that and we just say, oh, some guys got baptized, isn't that wonderful? No, that Paul recognized that they were missing out, that they didn't have everything God wanted for them. And so he said, you know, do you want the fullness of what the Father's got? Do you want fullness? He said, then here it is. So recognize it's so much more than just what you read. It's the heart of the Father behind it. All scripture was given by inspiration of the Holy Spirit. They're like love letters from a heavenly Father showing us how to live, how to walk, you know, revealing his love for us. In verses 8 to 10, Paul's got the, uh, he went into the synagogues and for three months spoke boldly, persuading, arguing, pleading about the kingdom of God. So that was what he was there for. This is about the kingdom. But when some became more and more stubborn, discrediting and reviling and speaking evil of the way before the congregation, he departed or he separated himself from them, taking the disciples with him and went on holding daily discussions in the lecture room of Tyrannus from about 10 o'clock till 3 p.m. So five hours a day he's teaching in, in Tyrannus. And, uh, and this continued for two years. And that's what I see when we get our venue for Open Heaven. I see a, like almost like a school of Tyrannus, that there will be teachings during the day, teachings at night. Everybody, Anybody who's got something they want to teach, it's open. Come and teach what you're good at. Come and teach what's on your heart. We can open it up to anybody. Worship, prayer, courts of heaven, talking about grace, mercy, whatever's on your heart. Come and, and speak in the school of, of Open Heaven's Tyrannus, so to speak. You know, because as we equip the people... They become, they can live out the fullness of what God's called them to be and to do. And so there's this teaching, this equipping that Paul did. And I forget who I was reading the other, I forget, I have so many books on the go. I forget who I was reading. But he was saying he did a, uh, he, he taught in his church on, on the fivefold. And the apostle took a little bit. The prophet took a little bit more. The evangelist didn't take much time at all. Pastor, yeah. You know, not quite as much as the apostle and the prophet. He said, but when he went on to talk about the teacher, it went on and on. He said he spent about three Sundays teaching on the teacher because teachers are judged by a stricter standard. But teachers speak what goes into people's ears and can change their lives for the good or for the bad. Right? And so teachers get a stricter judgment. And, and it's so important because if we teach, and we teach contrary to what is true, we've released wrong doctrine. We're sending people down a spirit of, of whatever. So it's really important, you know, that whatever I say, whatever you hear, take it home, study it out, come and talk to me. Because sometimes I'll say something that somebody hears, 
but they stop at what they've heard and haven't listened to the rest of what I've said or haven't heard what I've said in the past or sometimes I'm just completely inept at communicating what I should be. Um, but the thing is, don't allow division to come up. Come and talk because we both want truth. It doesn't matter whether you agree with me or disagree with me. We both want the truth. But it's got to be the truth in love yes. because truth in judgment is not from God. That's a religious spirit. So it's recognising that what we all want the same things. We all want this. So work together. So there's Paul teached in the school of Tyrannus and in synagogues until the synagogue sort of thought, well, no fruit going there, so I'm going to open my own school. In, verses nine, in chapter 19, verses 11 to 12, I love this. And God did unusual, extraordinary miracles by the hands of Paul. P miracles that don't happen like that every day. Unusual miracles, extraordinary. Well, miracles in themselves are unusual and extraordinary, aren't they? Yeah. But these miracles were like in another class of their own. He did extraordinary, unusual miracles, miracles of a kind that hadn't happened before, so that handkerchiefs or towels or aprons which had touched his skin were carried away and put upon the sick and their diseases left them and evil spirits came out of them. What an amazing thing, you know, just a handkerchief, just, just one of his coats. I remember Steve Ryder years and years and years ago, like I was in his church like a long time ago, um, but he actually took his coat off and put it on, a bun on something and people were coming and lying across the coat and going away and doing miracles because of the anointing that he carried. So you don't understand this. Have a look at what you're wearing. Like have a look at what you're wearing. Check it out. Just an ordinary piece of clothing, right? Wrong. You are saturated in the anointing. People can come and touch you, just touch the hem of your garment like they did with Jesus because you carry the same anointing as Jesus. Touch the hem of your garment, wow, healed. See, this is what we don't understand. Because we don't understand it, we don't release it. If we don't release it, how can, pe how can people receive it? But this is who you really are. The anointing that is in you actually saturates your clothes. Oh, my gosh. You know, it says in Mark chapter 16, you don't even have to pray for the sick. You just have to lay hands on them and they get healed. You don't have to pray. You don't have to say in the name of Jesus. It's just a touch. But you've got to be aware of the anointing that you carry. Mm -hmm. Sometimes it's just your shadow. Yeah, and sometimes it's just a shadow, like with Peter or, and, and other people. But I, I get this. You're not who you think you are. Right? New creation, supernatural beings flowing in the power of the Holy Ghost. You have the same anointing as Jesus Christ. You have the same power as he did because you have the authority to use his name. The Father loves you as much as he loves Jesus. He sees you the same as he sees Jesus. Jesus fully satisfied him on that cross so that we were fully accepted in Christ. Yeah. Oh, my gosh. And so these, yeah. these unusual, extraordinary miracles shouldn't be unusual and extraordinary in our lives. Should be the norm. Yeah. Like we read books like John G. Lake, um, Catherine Kuhlman, Maria Woodworth Edda. You know, um, Finney, we read all these amazing books of the, of the saints of old that did amazing things. Watchman Nee, and we think, oh, my gosh, isn't that amazing? Well, yeah, but it should be the norm. Yes. It should be the norm for every believer. They were just showing us what could be done. Yes. It wasn't just because they were special. They, they had actually sort of like they believed what God said in the word. And so he's got this school of Tyrannus and now he's got an unusual and amazing miracles that happen. And then down in verse 13, it goes all the way down to 17. This is where the travelling exorcist came in and uh, uh, prayed over somebody who had evil spirits. And they said in verse 13, I solemnly implore and charge you by the Jesus whom Paul preaches. And, uh, and then one, the evil spirit retorted, verse 15, Jesus I know and Paul I know, but who are you? Who are you? So we've got to make sure that your name is known, right? Your name is known. That's the first part of the Abrahamic blessing. God said, I will make your name great. Where is your name to be made great? Not necessarily in this world, although if he does, praise God, you can use the influence, the significance for the kingdom of God. But how about he makes your name great in the heavens, right? There's Janesh. She's a great intercessor. 
There's Cambry. She's great at, at sorting out how things work together and recognising how things need to be put in protocol. You know, and every one of you, you are great. But do you actually see yourself that way? Do you know that your name is great in the heavens? And it's just by the way they prayed, you knew that they did not have a relationship. We cast you out in the name of Paul, of Jesus, whom Paul preaches. They didn't have a relationship. We can go to church. Every meeting, we can go to church. We can sit in. We can be on the rosters. We can do, you know, doesn't mean you have a relationship with Jesus Christ. Just means you're a church goer. It's all about relationship. It's all about flowing with him and, and, and working with him. So we've got um, John Baptist disciples being baptised. We've got the school of Tyrannus. We've got special miracles. We've got evil spirits talking about knowing the name of Paul. And then in verse 18 to uh, 20, it says, Many of those um, uh, now believers came making full confession, thoroughly exposing their former deceptive and evil practices. And many of those who practiced curious magical arts collected their books and throwing them book after book on the pile, burned them in the sight of everybody. And when they counted the value of them, they amounted to about 50,000 pieces of silver. Thus the word of the Lord grew and spread and prevailed mightily in 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 the area and so you know there's a there's a repentance there's an open repentance it wasn't behind closed doors it wasn't behind oh my god you know how sometimes we say grace in a restaurant and it's the headache grace oh god i just ask you to bless this food you yeah, but we do sometimes we do it's a headache grace god i'm just you know shana no no my kid there thank you jesus <laughs> but is that you know we, am i the only one who ever used to do a headache grace when i was embarrassed <laughs> possibly <laughs> different now now I don't care what's there. But there was open repentance of past sins and they got rid of anything that connected them to their past life. So I remember back when I got born again, like forever ago, but when we got born again, they would people would actually go through their homes and pull out anything that they thought, like it might be rock music, you know, um, heavy metal, whatever, but they would clean out their homes. It was just automatic. They gave their lives to Jesus Christ. Nobody said, go home and sort your stuff out. It was just the leading of the Holy Spirit. We just need to go home and we need to get rid of anything. And so often people would come to us and say, well, I've, I've, I've got all this stuff. What am I supposed to do with it? I don't want it in my house anymore. How do I get rid of it? So there's this amazing power of the Holy Spirit. And so what we see there, and then in verse 21 to 41, um, Paul's message caused a riot. When was the last time you saw a riot in the marketplace because somebody preached the message of, of Christ? Not in Australia yet. Yet. But, you know, so he preached this amazing message all about Jesus Christ and it caused a riot. But so what? The name of Jesus was exalted and God turned even that around for good. And then in 1920, um, verses 17 to 30, towards the end, 38, I think it is, Paul is leaving Ephesus or he's, uh, let me start in verse 20. Um, in verse 17, he's, he's called for the elders of Ephesus to come and see him where he was in Miletus. In verse 18, when they arrived, he said to them, the elders of the church in Ephesus, he says, you're well acquainted with my manner of living among you from the first day that I set foot and how I continued afterwards, serving the Lord with all humility and tears and in the midst of adversity which befell me due to the plots of Jews. And then he says, I did not shrink from telling you anything that was for your benefit, teaching you in public meetings from house to house, but constantly and earnestly I bore testimony both to Jews and Greeks, urging them to turn in repentance due to God, have faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. And now you see I'm going to Jerusalem bound by the Holy Spirit. I'm obligated and compelled by the conviction of my own spirit, not knowing what will befall me there except the Holy Spirit clearly and emphatically affirms to me in city after city that imprisonment and suffering await me. But none of these things move me. I have underlined that and coloured that in my Bible. Nothing moves me. There are still things that do, like I haven't got my act together completely, but that is a core scripture for me. Nothing moves me. I don't esteem my life dear to myself. I just want to finish my course with joy and the ministry that I've obtained from the Lord. I want to be faithful 
to attest to the good news of the gospel. And so he goes on and he talks about um, take care, verse 28, take care, be on guard for yourselves and the whole flock over which the Holy Spirit has appointed you bishops and guardians to shepherd the church of the Lord, uh, which he obtained for himself. And then he says in verse 29, know that after I'm gone, ferocious wolves will get in among you, not sparing the flock, even from among your own selves. Men will come to the front who by saying perverse things will endeavour to draw away the disciples after themselves to their own party. Therefore, be always on alert and on your guide. So on your guard. So he's saying that even though, you know, people might even arrive from arise in your own congregation, people that are ambitious, people that want to, you know, do whatever it is that they want to do. He's saying be on be alert, be on guard, because ferocious wolves can come in. Uh, and and he knew that he was leaving, that his his he just wanted the elders that were taking over his his role over the church because he didn't know what was awaiting him, that they would that that they would make sure that the church was safe. So I love this fact about Paul, because we were talking about this in our prayer meeting. Paul actually was future proofing the church. He was saying, This is what is going to happen. I want you to be aware. This is what is going to happen. So if you are aware of it, you can be alert. You can stop it. Same as Jesus when he was um, talking to the disciples. You know, he said, "You are." Um, they said, "You are the Christ," and he said, "Yes." And I'm building the ecclesia, and I've got the keys of the kingdom, and you can bind and loose, and all of that. And then he said, "But I'm going to go to Jerusalem." And I'm going to be bound and crucified. And Peter grabbed him and said, no, 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 that can't happen to you. But what Jesus was doing is future-proofing the disciples. You need to be aware of where I am going and what I'm doing so that you can walk with me in this, so that you can be a part of it, that you won't oppose what God is doing. So as God is doing something new, it's the old that tend to oppose it and that stop the new move of the Holy Spirit, and that's not going to happen. But he's saying, I really want you to be aware. So all of this, these these like two chapters, 18, 9, or three chapters, 18, 19, and 20, it's the basis of the church in Ephesus. So as you can read the, the letter of Ephesus, but unless you understand where it's coming from, unless you understand it was birthed in miracles, it was, it was birthed in sound teaching, it was birthed in um, baptisms, it was birthed in uh, all these amazing things that, that your name's got to be known in the spirit realm like his was. Unless we have an understanding of that, Ephesus really loses a little bit of its depth. So, uh, you know, study it out. Study it out. And so we recognise these things. But then in Re Revelation chapter 2, verses 1 to 4, the church of, of Ephesus is rebuked for losing its first love. So there's a thing right there, make sure you don't lose your first love. You know, Holy Spirit, keep me in my first love. Don't ever let it come to works or because I have to or, you know, routine or ordinary. Keep my first love fervent. Because if we're not living out of the holy of holies, where are we living? Out of his presence. Got to be out of his presence. So there's these amazing things in, um, in Ephesus. He talks about the benefits of salvation. It's such an uplifting book. It's wonderful. Um, but as you know, in 2 Timothy, just turn there. And it's a book that is written to the Christian, the Christian church. It was not written to Hebrew Christians. It was written to the Christian church. In 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 15, it says, Study, and I've got the Amplified Classic, Study and be eager. Do your utmost to present yourself to God approved and tested by trial, a workman who has no cause to be ashamed, correctly analysing and accurately dividing, rightly handling and skillfully teaching the word of truth. So there's no way I can do that in my own head. There's no way I can do that. I have to rely on the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is my teacher. The Holy Spirit is the one who reveals the truth. And so, Holy Spirit, I want to study. I want to do my utmost to present myself approved to God. I, I don't want to be ashamed. I, I want to correctly analyse and accurately divide the word of truth. But Holy Spirit, unless you do that, unless you do it in me and through me, unless it's by your anointing and your power, what I'm coming out with is simply what I think. I need the anointing on it. Now turn, to, um, turn the page to chapter 3, verse 16. 
It says every scripture, and that word is logos. It is not revelation. It's talking about the written word of God. Every scripture is God-breathed. It's given by God's inspiration. It's profitable for instruction, for reproof and conviction of sin, for correction of error and discipline in obedience, uh, and for training in righteousness so that we would be conformed to God's will and thought, purpose and action, that the man or the woman of God may be complete and proficient, well-fitted and thoroughly equipped for every good work. And so it is written, you know, like, so that we would be, we would be mature and, and proficient and complete, but it was breathed by God. It's God breathed. The Holy Spirit is the author, which means he has the authority. And so we, we walk, we allow the Holy Spirit to minister to us. So the thing with the books is, First and Second Corinthians is about conviction. It's about reproving the church because of the way they were behaving. So First and Second Corinthians, it follows after this verse sixteen. You know, for um, profitable instruction, uh, re, uh, conviction of, of sin, for correction of error and discipline, for training in righteousness. So Romans is all about doctrine. Romans is about teaching you know, salvation and all of that. It's about doctrine. And then we've got First and Second Corinthians, which is a reproof. It's actually a conviction. It's, hey, guys, you've got it all wrong. You're handling communion wrong. You're doing everything wrong, <laughs> not everything. But it's dealing with the body of the Corinthian church, plus he's addressing personal issues. I've heard that somebody's sleeping with his father's wife or, you know, I'm hearing that this is happening and, and you're asking about meat sacrifice to idols. So he's dealing with a corporate's um, as well as individual issues. So that was actually a, a, a reproving. Galatians is a correction because that actually gone away from the spirit into the works of the flesh. Paul said, who's bewitched you? You started everything off in the spirit. Why are you ending up in the flesh? So it was a correction. And then we come to Ephesians, which is... Um, you know, like this is a doctrinal thing again. This is an instruction in righteousness. This is how you're supposed to live. But in all of that, um, it's recognizing that there's such a power, such a power in the in the grace of God and the, and the the very word of God. And I'm telling you that in the times to come, a lot of us. And I'm starting up. I'm still working on Nahum because I know that's where I left off the books of the Bible. And we're going to be doing a video series. It'll be on the website. You can just knock on the books as I do them, so that what I promised I, would com I am completing. But I just felt that the prayer time that we have here is, was more important. But what is important, that you immerse yourself in the word of God because there is so much out there that sounds like the gospel but is not. And remember that it says that deception would be around in the end of the ages, that there will be false apostles, false teachers, Angels of light. You need to know what the word of God is saying. You need to know for yourself so that you've got that witness in your spirit. Wait a minute. Right. Something's not right. Wait a minute. I'm not quite sure what's wrong here, but yeah. I just have this, this check in my spirit. I just, want to, I just want to step back a bit. We need to know the truth of the word of God. We need to know God's world view of Christianity. Because we've got people out there with the gospel of the LGBTQ and they're getting lots of converts. We've got the gospel of transgenderism. Lots of converts. And recognise that it's kind of like a religion. But we need to know the truth. And so Ephesians is a really good place to start to know the truth. So immerse yourself in the word. And like I said, Ephesians and Colossians are very similar, but there's different emphases in the books. Ephesians talks about blessings, which I love. It talks about the heavenly realm, which I love. And it talks about Christ being the riches of God to us. So I just want you to turn, and we're going to go through this in deeper. Is it too much, Janice? <laughs> Sorry, I couldn't help myself. <laughs> if you turn to Ephesians, we're going to be going through this in, in greater depth. But in Ephesians chapter 1, just look at, the, look at what God is laying out. Like it's just the most amazing stuff. And we just kind of like read it. Mine is so, like I've got a new Bible because this one's falling apart. 
But mine is coloured in, like everywhere. Red is anything to do with who I am because of the blood. Orange is glory. Green is prayer. Blue is the Holy Spirit. Purple is the kingdom. I've got pink, which is hard to see at night time, for healing. So, you know, we've got all these different... I've got um, tents drawn, you know, camp here a while. Um, I've got little love hearts growing and God loves me. I've got scales for justice. I mean, mark your Bible because the more you mark the Bible, the more your Bible marks you. And it's important that the Bible marks you, right? So starting in Ephesians chapter 1, verse 1, it says, Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus by the divine will of God. So you're going to find that a lot of apostles are rising up that are not appointed by God. So you need to be able to discern, not saying judge, do not judge, but discern. And um, I never even knew what an apostle was until I had about five ministers come to me and say, you are an apostle. And I went, oh, yeah, okay, what, whatever. But they recognised the fruit of it in what I was doing. And so in the very first thing, and then it says in verse 2, may grace be yours from God our Father and from the Lord Jesus. But in verse 1 it says that Paul is an apostle of Christ Jesus the Messiah by the divine will of of God to the saints at Ephesus and the faithful in Christ. So there are saints and there are faithful. So any church will tell you that there's a, a, a core group that carry most of the weight, a core group that basically do more than any others just turn up. They're the saints. The ones that are involved in the house are the faithful in Christ, those who ones who stand, those ones. And so even right there there's a division. One body of Christ, then there's the saints, and then there's the faithful. Big difference, isn't there? So it talks about being in Jesus. So in verse 3, we are blessed. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Messiah, who has blessed us in Jesus Christ with every spiritual blessing in heavenly places. So the very first thing he says, well, you're blessed with every spiritual blessing in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. Nothing's held back. You are blessed with everything. On top of that, you've got the Abrahamic blessing. On top of that, you've got the blessing that was released in the Garden of Eden in Genesis 1.28. Like, I mean, you are blessed beyond blessed beyond blessed. And the power of the blessing means that every dry place, it, will re it releases um, lushness. It releases an abundance. The power of the blessing is sometimes greater than prayer. Um, because of its, it, that was what God gave Adam and Eve to fulfill the mandate, be fruitful, multiply, replenish the earth, subdue, take dominion. It was by the power of the blessing. So, you know, so he starts off by saying, man, you're so blessed. And then in verse 4, it says, even in his love, he chose you in Christ. So you're blessed and you're chosen. In verse 5, you're foreordained. He foreordained you to be adopted as his own child through Jesus Christ in accordance with the purpose of his will. So you were foreordained before the beginning of time to be his child, to be adopted by him, to belong to him. So blessed, chosen, foreordained to be adopted into his family. And then in verse 6 he says, so that it might be to the praise and the commendation of his glorious grace. That's what the uh, Amplified says, his glorious grace. So you're blessed, you know, you're chosen, you're foreordained to belong to him and on top of that, you've got this glorious grace that is poured out upon you. And then in verse 7, he says to him, in him we have redemption. You're redeemed. Psalm 107 verse 2 says, let the redeemed of the Lord say so. I am the redeemed of the Lord. And I say that I am redeemed from the hand of the adversary. Amen. Amen. So verse 7, and then he goes on to verse 8. And in verse 8, he says that he has lavished upon us every kind of wisdom and understanding. Lavished. Like not being skingy, not scrimping, not thinking, oh, well, she's got enough for what she needs or he needs, but he's lavished his wisdom upon you. That's, you've got more than enough. You've got more than you could ever need. You've got so much you can give it away and not even miss it. You have, he lavishes his love upon you. He lavishes his wisdom. Like this is the depth of love. It is so much more than anything we have ever encountered before. And then in verse 9, he says, he makes known to us the mystery of his will. And is this, in accordance with his good pleasure, which he had previously purposed and set forth in him. So all of this is in him. And he says in verse 9, there's a plan. I've purposed this. There is a purpose. There is a plan. Verse 10, 
Like, how can you even get through this without even worshipping, falling on your face before God and saying, wow, you are just so much more than amazing. So in verse 10, he says, his plan for the maturity of the times and the climax of the ages to unify all things and to head them up and consummate them in Christ, things in heaven and things on the earth. So everything in heaven and on earth is going to be summed up and consummated in Christ. Nothing's left out. Oh my goodness, restoration of all things. You know, honestly, put your shouting shoes on or put something on because this is just so amazing and so wonderful and the love of God is just pouring through every verse and it's almost like Paul can't take a breath because he just wants you to know, oh my gosh, you're chosen, it's foreordained. He's lavished you with this. He's given you that. The blessings are there. And he's just pouring it out. It's like, I I just, you know, I need to get it. I need to get them to see. I need to get them to see. I need to get them to take hold of this, to get the revelation because God has lavished his love upon you. He's lavished his love. So whatever you need is not going to be a strain on the heavenly kingdom, is it? You already have everything. It is lavished upon you. So doesn't that change things when you go before him and pray? God, I just want to thank you that you lavishly, you lavishly have poured your wisdom out upon me. So I thank you that I've got the divine solution for this challenge. God, I just want to thank you that I might feel rejected by that person, but I am so accepted in the beloved with you. He's just like, this is, this, this is wholeness. This is the love of the Father. This is the power of Christ. This is grace just being poured into us. This is the Holy Spirit breathing life, saying, come on, look at all the Father has for you. Look at how much he's holding nothing back. He's lavished. He's chosen. It's foreordained. Um, it's all there. It's everything. And then he's got in um, verse 11, In him also we were made God's heritage. We are God's inheritance. How amazing is that? You are God's inheritance. Just as we are heirs of God and joint heirs with Jesus Christ, Paul says, you know what? You're his inheritance. Jesus died so God could receive you as his inheritance. You're his inheritance. Does that make it special? And then in verse 12, so that we who first hoped in Christ to live for the praise of his glory. We hope in Christ to live for the praise of his glory. And then in verse 13 and 14, it says, you know, in him you also have heard the word of truth, the glad tidings of your salvation. You've believed in, adhered to, relied on him, and you were stamped with the seal of the long-promised Holy Spirit, and that spirit is the guarantee of our inheritance, the first fruits, the pledge, the foretaste, the down payment on our heritage in anticipation of its full redemption and our acquiring acquiring Requiring complete possession to the praise of his glory. So he's saying you're sealed by the spirit of guarantee for what is to come. You will receive it all. It is sealed. You're in union with him. You are in union in him. And Jesus is the king. And he works. A de- he worked a decisive, eternal victory over Satan and his kingdom. He completely demolished it. So when you think of Jesus at that cross, it's not just sin that was destroyed and the sin nature in people. It wasn't that we were under we were under sin's dominion, but Jesus, when he died on that cross and he rose from the dead, we are no longer under sin but under grace. Sin was completely destroyed. Sin is the root, the root nature, the sin nature in us. If that was destroyed at the cross, then the fruit of sin, which is poverty, the fruit of sin, which is sickness and disease, the fruit of sin, which is loss of hearing, the fruit of sin is not saying that we sin, but the very nature of sin that was destroyed at the cross releases healing and wholeness and health, releases prosperity, releases life eternally. You know, it's this amazing thing that when he destroyed poverty at that cross and he took his poverty on him and gave us his prosperity. He not only destroyed individual prosperity, he destroyed the world system. And we still talk as if the world system has the power, but it was not. It was destroyed at the cross. It acts like it has the power. It's making plans like it has the power, but it was destroyed. Jesus Christ destroyed it at the cross, just as he destroyed Satan's um, 
on a health care system, if you like, because he does nothing but want to bring steal, kill and destroy. So Jesus destroyed that. Understand what Jesus did. It wasn't just for us individually. It was for eternity. It was over everything in, the Satan, in Satan's kingdom. Oh my gosh, isn't he the most amazing, wonderful, glorious king? And we serve him. We live in his kingdom. And so recognize that, you know, the banks can say this and the banks can do that and the government can do that. But it says in the word of God that the, the, that the, the government of this age is passing away, right? And God's kingdom is coming. So we've got to recognize the truth of his word. Oh, my gosh, you read this book and you should be standing up rejoicing, carrying on, doing cartwheels around the room. The, the, the shofar, the shofar. victory we should never ever 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 think defeat you know what if there's a car accident well I'm not going to be there because Jesus was never involved in a car accident and I'm in Christ and he's in me come on guys let's get your mind renewed to what the word of God says isn't he amazing so the bank system the governments they were all destroyed at the cross it was all destroyed. It's just that they have the image of deception that they are all powerful, that the elite are doing this. Well, the elite can do whatever they like because God has a plan that cannot be overturned. And unless they get saved, they're not going to enjoy the future very much. It's going to be a different reset for them. You know, so start thinking from what is God up to? What is God doing? Where is he coming from? What's happening here? You know, because so often I hear, oh, you know, the government's done this and this law has done. Yes, so what? Out of that, I can take the wisdom of God and God might say, I want you to do this, this. So I'll do it. But so what? Their plans are subject to futility because our king is the king of all kings, the Lord of all lords. And he has decreed that the government of this world is passing away and his government is on his shoulders and that is what is coming. And people can talk about doom and gloom and antichrist. Yeah, I'm not a, he's coming. But so what? My thing is the king of kings is coming. The Lord of lords is on his way. And the restoration of all things. You know, come on, we've got to get... We can't be affected by the things of the world or the way they think or the media or anything else. This is what they've done. So what? God's told me to do this. That means that's nullified in my life. We've got to be a little bit more. What's the word? Militant. I love that word. Militant, a little bit more forcefully aggressive, a little bit more assertive in our faith. And just a recognition that when Jesus died on that cross, everything the enemy had planned, everything was totally destroyed. Everything, everything, total victory in Jesus Christ, total victory. So it doesn't matter what you face. It doesn't matter what you're looking at. Just speak to it and say, you will turn into my victory. All things work out for my good. I don't need to know what Satan's doing. I just need to follow the Holy Ghost and he will destroy everything. You know, it's, it's just, oh my gosh, this is the book of Ephesians. We haven't even got into the first prayer that starts in verse 15. This is just the first few verses and Paul is saying, this is what you've got. This is the wealth. See, chapters 1 to 3 are all about the wealth of what you have in Christ. The wealth of who you are and what you have. Verses 4, 5, and 6 is about your walk, how you walk it out with believers, with husbands and wives, with children, with employers and employees. It's how you walk it out. It's how you grieve the Holy Spirit. It's how you can come under his inebriation effect. It's all of that kind of stuff, you know. And then halfway through Ephesians chapter 6, well, here's the war. But this is everything you need for it. You've got the armour of God. Everything is there. And then you're just going to preach the gospel boldly. Right? That's basically it. Prayer for all saints. That's basically it. But the beautiful thing is that Ephesians lays out that you don't go to war till you know who you are and you know what you have. And then in verses four to six, four, chapter 4 to verses 6 to 10, you know how to walk it out. So you've got your wealth, 
but this is how I live this. This is where the rubber meets the road, making sure relationships are right and all of that, relationships with the Holy Ghost, relationships, then you go to war. But so often as believers, we've gone to war before we even know really who we are or what we have or how to walk it out. And then we get smashed. Our families get attacked. Stuff happens and we think, but God. And God's saying, well, there's there's a procedure here. Know who you are. Know what you have. Know your wealth. Know the wealth that I've given you. Know how to walk it out. And then you are positioned for war. And you will win. Isn't he just the best God? Just the best God. So in all of this, you know, from a chapter 3 down to whatever. What's the time? Oh, my gosh, it's 4 o'clock. <sighs> but you've got total victory over the, over the kingdom. And you are so vitally united with Christ that nothing can bring, nothing can separate you except yourself. You can, he, he will never separate from you. And you will always be united spirit on spirit. But if your soul gets in the way, that's a slight challenge. But spiritually, you are so united with him, like the vine and the branch. And for every scripture that talks about Christ being in us, there are at least 10 that talk about us being uh, in him. So you know, God is really trying to get across to you in him, with him, by him, through him, of him, and by the power of the blood. And God was completely satisfied with Christ's sacrifice, completely satisfied. Therefore, God is completely satisfied with you because his sacrifice was all about you. You are completely, God is completely satisfied with you. Just going back a little bit and then we'll leave it. Chapters 1 to 3 is about the truth of our wealth, of our identity and about what we have. Chapters 4 to 6 is practical. It's about our walk. It's about what we do. And then the last part of chapter 6 is about war and intercession. So chapters 1 to 3 is positional. You're in Christ, seated with him. It's about possession. Chapters 4 to 6 is living by grace where the rubber hits the road. Chapters 1 to 3 is everything is completed in Christ. It has been done. Christianity is based on what Jesus has done, not about what we are doing, not about how many days I've fasted, not about how much hours I've spent in the Word, not about how many prayers I've prayed, not about how many people I've evangelized. It is all about Jesus Christ and what he has done. And the minute we start coming to God and saying, but God, I have, guess what? You've put on the throne instead of Christ. You've put a self on the throne and we've got to dethrone self completely. So we sit in that place, uh, in you know, heavenly places with Christ coming from a place of rest. And instead of working by faith, we simply do the good works that he, t- he called us to do before the foundation of the world. Yeah. But let me read you this out of Jeremiah chapter 15, verse 16, and it is the NET, New English Translation. I love this. Oh, my gosh. I pray that when you open the book of Ephesians, the letter of Ephesians, and you start to read it, you get so completely drunk in the spirit that you have encounters with Father, Son, and Holy Ghost, that things change, that revelation jumps off off every page, that it actually transforms you into everything God wants you to be. And Jeremiah chapter 15, verse 16, in the New English translation says, as your words came to me. I drank them in and they filled my heart with joy and happiness because I belong to you. Fill my heart with joy and happiness because I belong to you. So I want you to drink deep of the grace wine that's in the book of Ephesians. Drink deep of the wine of grace that's in the book of Ephesians. And let it just really reveal to you the power of living as a new new creation and how blessed we are, how blessed we are. As your words came to me, I drank them in and they filled my heart with joy and happiness 
because I belong to you. And that's why people like Robaham, I don't know if I've got it here, I don't know, Robaham said, um, the good news is a happy message of a glad God. And uh, Martin Luther said something along the lines, well, when you read the, you read the gospel, it brings nothing but laughter and joy. <laughs> but drink deep. Be inebriated by the truth of his word, the power of the spirit. Amen.